Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Neil and this is Brad. Um, we're from EA Technology in Australia here in Brisbane and today we're going to talk about PRPD data analysis. The contents of the presentation today, we, we do a very, very quick overview because we're, we're talking about more in detail stuff. So only a quick overview of PD and their different online centres. Um, we'll talk about how the PRPD is created and what, what it can um, basically tell us. And then Brad will go through um, case studies with analysis to show you the sort of things that we found and how we, what's our, what's our thought process, uh, how we're using the PRPD to make the best analysis, diagnosis, um, and to help uh, our customers as, uh, come up with the, with the, the information that they need to, to prevent failures um, and, and, and know what to look for when they open up. So quick overview on the PD and the online census. So partial discharge activity, the, the, the two main things that we're looking for is stuff that's happening deep inside insulation. So um, a void, as we can see in the, in the top left-hand side here, we've got a solid insulation, so plastic type insulation, which is a void is, has been introduced during the manufacture. Um, so the, the discharge will happen and it's surrounded by that. And, and then we have things that are happening on the surface of insulation. You can see on the cable termination here. So that's in this particular case will be phase to phase type discharge and discharge tracking across the surface of insulation. So PD can be on the outside of the insulation or just involved with the, um, the, the or inside the, the insulation itself. Now partial discharge is something that is a discharge that doesn't completely bridge the electrode. But it's going, to, it's going to continue degrading the insulation layer until we end up with failure. So when partial discharge happens, we produce light, small amounts of heat because we've got localized arcing, um, smell, which is also uh, which we also which is very important when you go into a substation. If you can smell the ozones and nitrous oxides, uh, please be careful. You, you're already in a degraded situation at that point. But in order to, to find things earlier, we, we use the final two techniques, which are sound and electromagnetic waves. So the sound will absolutely find the, the, the things happening on the surface of insulation and the electromagnetic waves are the best solution for finding things that are happening deep inside insulation. So for sound, you can use your own ears. So again, if you go into a substation, you can hear crackling and fizzing then you're probably in a place which is already in a, a quite a dangerous state. So you have to be very careful with that. What we're trying to do with our, our technology and with partial discharge detect, uh, detection is find things before they get to that stage and also find things where it's just, it's harder. Um, it, it hasn't got to that degraded level. So we use the ultrasonic techniques. We've got pictures here where you can see flexible uh, airborne sensors, we have parabolic fish for doing things at a distance, and contact probes that we can listen through the metalwork, listen for the vibrations, and listen for the, the, the ultrasonic surface type discharge that's happening through a sealed chambers. For electromagnetic techniques, we use the transient earth voltage, which is a capacitive plate that is on the end of the ultrasound instrument here. We can use HFCTs, which go around earth braids, particularly on cables, and we can use the UHF um, techniques as well for doing things at a distance where we can't place a capacitive plate on in particular, and, and in switchyards, high voltage switchyards, where um, the transmission of VHF, HF signals means that localization is preferable using the UHF techniques. So we have a UHF um, directional antenna in the uh, in the bottom right picture there. Now, all of these techniques um, will give us the PRPD patterns that we're going to be talking about today. So, just recap on the main PD classifications. These will behave very, very differently. Uh, they'll behave differently, they'll be measured differently, and they'll produce different types of PRPD patterns. So, internal classification. Uh, of PD and internal discharge. We've got two cavities shown in this particular picture here, one in the center of the insulation and one close to one of the conductors. If we have 
um, a discharge happening inside the centre of that insulation, you'll get you'll get the PRPD pattern occurring on both halves of the the sine wave cycle um, quite consistently. If the void or the cavity is towards one of the conductors, the high voltage or the earth, then what you will find on the PRPD pattern is that um, it will be dominant on one half of the cycle only. Surface discharge, we've got things that are happening across the insulation. Now, with a surface discharge, one of the big things where it's different to the, um, to the internal cavity type discharge is is that you can have multiple small paths. So you, if you're having treeing and tracking, you'll be getting a discharge at multiple sites. So lots and lots of sites of discharge will be occurring simultaneously. Whereas in a cavity discharge, it will be almost like a capacitor breaking down inside of that, that void. Corona discharge is, is very easily distinguished using the PRPD pattern because we only have one of the conductors Involved. So it's a sharp point into a gas. So you're on going, only going to find activity um, presented on one half of the cycle um, on the PRPD pattern. And a, another important one that we will show uh, some examples today is discharge across a gap or contact of floating metal work. It, it's got some characteristics of internal discharge, some characteristics of surface discharge in terms of it's quite a low repetition, uh, it's quite a high um, amplitude of activity, but it's got a high repetition rate like surface discharge has. And the main thing about this is consistency in the amplitude. So whereas with an internal discharge, you get a breakdown of the cavity, the next time that the, um, the, the discharge the next, the next pulse of energy may be at a slightly different amplitude due to the fact that when, it, when a cavity, when a discharge occurs in a cavity, you will end up with surface charges coming across the cavity itself. You'll have byproducts of the discharge. You might have some elements of semiconductor built up with, with carbonization in there. And the next pulse of activity will, will likely be at a slightly different amplitude. When we go to a discharge across a gap, it's like a capacitor firing off at the same amplitude every single time. So the discharge will build up and fire, build up and fire. So it's a very different type of pattern, which we'll see going forwards between the internal and, and the, the gap type discharge. So let's talk about that in a bit more um, a bit more detail as we show how the PRPD pattern is created. So here we've got representation of um, voltage across a cavity. So the voltage, we have line voltage, which is de designated by VA here. So that's the, um, the phase to earth voltage across the whole of the insulation. Then we have VC here is the voltage across a cavity that we've got inside the insulation. Now what will happen is the voltage is, as the, the line voltage increases, the voltage of course across the cavity increases until it gets to such a point that the, um, the breakdown strength of that cavity is exceeded and the voltage across it will collapse. The voltage level drops down. It doesn't drop all the way down all the way down back to zero, it drops down to a level, usually 100 volts or so. And then the voltage across that cavity will start building up. Now when that cavity, when that voltage has collapsed, that pulse of energy occurs, and these are the P PD pulses that we're detecting electromagnetically. So the next time, because we've got surface effects happening inside the cavity, because we've got the, uh, the charges building up, that next pulse may not reach the exact same. It won't have the same inception voltage, uh, extinction voltage, it, it may be slightly different. So there will be a slightly random nature about them. But they will occur at roughly the same point on the, the leading edge and the falling edge of the sine wave, which is the highest uh, rate of change of transfer of the voltage. That's where we're going to see our PD pulses happening. 
So when you see the PD pulses happening on cavity type discharge, you'll see them occurring on the rising and falling edge. And there'll be a certain number, but there won't be too many pulses happening on every cycle. So they will be around the same point, but slightly random in terms of its amplitude and exactly where they will uh, occur due to the fact that we've got the, this effect going on inside the cavity. Surface discharge will tend to occur on the peaks of the voltage and be more frequent. Okay, so that's how discharges recur um, over time. So PRPD pattern is a representation of the activity, of the amplitude of the activity that we're getting from any of the sensors, whether they're the TEV sensors, ultrasonic, HFCT, the UHF type sensors. So it's the amplitude of the activity on the y-axis, the vertical axis, plotted against the phase angle where it occurs on the horizontal axis of 360 degrees over time. So when we look at these PRPD patterns that we have on the screen here, this is all taken using the UltraTev Plus instrument. And for the UltraTev Plus instrument, when we're in record mode, we capture 10 seconds of uh, data. So uh, 500 sam uh, cycles on a 50 hertz system or 600 cycles on a 60 hertz system. So we're plotting with these pulses, the amplitude on this, this Y axis against where it happens and for every one of the pulses that we detect over those 500 cycles in this case. Now we also get the, um, when they're occurring at exactly the same point in time or, or very close at that point in time, you see the intensity builds up. So these, the way that this is presented is an intensity pattern to that. So you can see that we've got dark blue going into red and that just shows that you're getting more of the pulses occurring um, at this very start point, which is where the leading edge uh, and the falling edge of the sine wave will be. Again, with ultrasonic, we have similar things going on. With HFCT, we've got very similar sort of patterns. So we're looking for two, two patterns on a single phase discharge, which are occurring at 180 degrees away from each other, because that's the, falling, uh, the rising and falling edge of that sine wave. Now, it's important if you're using the instrument that you have got a good lock to the phase. So you need to be, um, we need that instrument to be locked onto the phase so that we can see exactly when that is happening, when that discharge event is occurring on the point um, of that 360 degree cycle. Now, if you, if you have a very um, variable frequency, so the, the frequency is moving around and you haven't locked onto a phase, you can uh, start seeing a PRPD pattern with a poor phase lock, not giving you the information that you need to make your best decision. So you can see in the left-hand side here, we've got a, um, a phase pattern. This is the same discharge source where the, the frequency is drifting and we haven't locked onto the, uh, the frequency, the mains frequency. And we've got a pattern that's looking more like a, a noise type pattern than it is for distinct clusters. If we look on the, the picture on the right hand side, the exact same source, but we've made sure that we've got that phase lock. So the instrument is locked to the 50 hertz or 60 hertz phase. And you can see we have two very distinct clusters, which is giving us the indication that we've got internal void discharge going on inside that piece of plant that we're testing. So it is important to make sure we get the phase lock. That's showing you quite a large drift. It's also quite important, even if you get very small drift, if you've got a really good um, phase lock, then um, you, you, can, you can just make a little bit more um, diagnosis here. So again, these two recordings taken on the same, same location, uh, detecting the same discharge source. The one on the left hand side, yes, we've absolutely got phase clustering going on. So we know that we've got discharge 180 degrees apart. The one on the right hand side, we've, we've got a complete phase lock. So we were 100% uh, locked onto that phase for the whole 10 second reading. And you can see at this stage, we can now identify that there are two distinct clusters. So 
So we have one cluster and one phase here, and the second cluster showing uh, on the second phase. So just having that quality, high quality, enables us to make a little bit more judgment about what we're seeing, the type of discharge it is, how many um, potential sources and how many phases are involved. The PRPD pattern can tell us a lot, and but it will be different for different types of shapes, different types of defects. So you can see the, um, if you look at the top left picture there, we have uh, cavity type discharges. All those different shapes will give us slightly different, um, slightly different patterns of, of PRPD. The more that we start building up our knowledge, building up databases of, of results, the more we can we can actually start um, narrowing down specifics against types of insulation and types of switchgear and what the defects may be. So the cavities will, depending where they sit and depending on their shape, will dictate the, the, um, the pattern of the insulation, although there will be consistencies between all internal type PD um, patterns. Surface discharge, whether it occurs across from um, a conductor to an earth, or whether it occurs across a gap, will give you different discharges. And as we mentioned earlier, the corona discharge will be very much on one half the cycle only, because we've only got one of those conductors involved. So some of the classic patterns that you need to look for are, are shown um, in these next slides here. So the first one on the top left, we have the internal void single phase type discharge. Single phase because we've just got one set, uh, one pair of clusters 180 degrees apart. It will be inside the bulk of the insulation because we've got very consistent um, amplitude on the both halves of this cycle. And what you'll find with internal void classic internal void discharges, you'll have this wave type pattern, and you will see that the, the front end of the, the clusters are usually more intense. So it's like a leading edge that you see there. So that's almost dictated by the um, the, uh, the dimensions and the physical characteristics of uh, of the cavity inside inside the insulation. Then we have the, the sort of cluster, extra cluster that comes behind, and that's almost like the variability that we see due to um, the byproducts of the discharge staying in the cavity and not dissipating. Immediately. So if we see two wave clusters about 180 degrees apart, relatively low repetition rate, so one, two, three pulses per cycle, then that is a classic internal solid insulation, internal void discharge. Going down to the, uh, or going across to the, um, the top right picture, the PD inside an oil fill transformer. This is, is another important shape if you're testing transformers, you're testing um, oil switch gear, is that you have a very distinct pattern for oil, um, for oil PRPD patterns or something that's happening in oil. This is not going to be a defined cavity, it's going to be, it, it's fluid insulation. So there will be things happening, there'll be um, bubbles being formed potentially around the discharge site. The, um, it, it's not a defined cavity, which is then storing this um, surface effects and the surface charges are building up. It's very much more fluid. So what you find with a PD inside an oil filled um, plant, which you, you can often, of course, um, back up once you find this through doing a DGA test, is you find this cloud type structure again. Single phase will be two sets of clusters 180 degrees apart. There'll be a cloud type structure and it will be, um, the intensity will be stronger inside the center of that cloud. You'll have a relatively, or you can have a relatively high amplitude. So you can see we're getting about 20 to 25 dBs of TEV here. But you'll also get a much higher discharge rate. So if you look, um, the intensity numbers here, the red, le the red level is somewhere between 9 and 15 pulses at that exact point, whereas over in the internal void, you're seeing the intensity level on red is only 2 to 4 pulses. 
you're getting much more pulses occurring during your your 10 second measurement inside that oil compared to inside that that single cavity that we've got so if you see this cloud shape very um, much of a cloud shape very intense in the middle then suspect that you're getting discharge that's happening inside the oil insulation the bottom left is contact or that gap type discharge floating metal risk so in this particular case as we showed on the picture we had a very defined um, gap between the the two conductors where it was going to break down and discharge very much like a capacitor and because we're not enclosed inside a cavity what you're not getting is that that surface uh, surface charge building up you're not getting um, that um, change to the there's a semiconductor layer which will change the amplitude as we as we uh, each cycle uh, continues on so you're going to get very flat lines across the 180 degrees because you're discharging at almost the same amplitude every single time so that's what you see it's very characteristic in certain switch yards this is not a problem in certain um, other instances that contact type problem uh, discharge can be a significant problem and so brad will show you some examples of that also um, it will be affected by whether it is a flat piece or whether there are specific point areas that, are, that will discharge during that time. But again, all these contact floating metal work type PD will be flat, two large flat lines. Uh, the bottom right picture here is just showing you the effect where the void is near one of the, either the earth or the phase conductor. So you can see in this particular instance, we're very much, we're dominated on first cluster and the second cluster is is almost non-existent at that point that is really just telling us that it is that it is close to the earth or, or the conductor how useful that is in in the actual going and in um, uh, rectifying a problem um, maybe not so much but at the end of the day it's more information to, to give you uh, to build up your um, your diagnosis of what may be happening Moving on to ultrasonic, we can again infer quite a lot of different things based on, on the pattern. So the corona discharge is the top left hand side one. That is something that is happening just on one half of the cycle, very, very uh, consistently like that. That's 100% corona discharge. You also, if you're listening to the sound, it becomes a deeper sound. The main thing that we can do with, with surface discharge is we can find the difference between single phase and multi-phase and that's really all dictated by the the, um, the, uh, the the length of the clusters if you like so you can see here on a single phase we have quite sharp clustering and on the bottom picture we have multi-phase phase to phase type discharge and you can see it is occurring for a much longer period of time over that 360. And this is because we're getting basically more than one phase involved. So the single phase versus multi-phase, you can see with, with um, surface discharge quite readily. You can see in that we've got much longer off period on the single phase compared to the multi-phase. But with this, this is again, high levels of discharge, surface tracking, lots of, lots of pulses occurring. The contact discharge, that we found with the electromagnetic technique where we're going across a gap also occurs on ultrasonic because we've usually got that air path to the side of the um to where the problem is and again you can see in this you get these relatively long flat lines sometimes you'll get this where it's curving down a little bit but in general you're getting a long flat line of activity on both halves of the cluster again that gives us an indication that we're getting contact floating metal work um, type discharge occurring once again. Pat is answering so many questions. Three questions coming in. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Swapping furiously. Now, so I'm going to swap over and give Brad a, a break for the typing, and then I'll do the typing while you talk case studies. All right. Okay, let's go through some case studies with some phase plot analysis. So we've got uh, 
eight case studies this morning. This is case study number one. So this is a, an ultrasonic test um, where we've used a flexible microphone. The test was taken into an air insulated levitated chamber. When I look at that phase plot, I see a contact PD across a gap, which is uh, being caused by surface PD. I know it's surface PD because the ultrasonic microphone can hear it. Within the PD uh, plot, we see rectangular shapes. So the first rectangular shape, the first rectangular shape is there, which I've highlighted in red. And that's consistent with sparks jumping across a gap um, as Neil talked about earlier. I can also see that there's a second phase getting involved here, which is highlighted there with the blue. Um, so when I look at this phase plot, I say surface PD, contact problem, most likely two phases are being involved because of how far they're going across the phase plot there. And then on this one, we were able to get a visual on what caused the PD. And this was the outcome from that. We had reduced clearances between two 11 kV conductors at a cable termination. The outsides of those two terminations were starting to discharge towards each other. Probably most evident there in the center photograph where my mouse is, where you can see those two white uh, dags of material starting to grow towards each other. So eventually that will get bigger and hotter and start to burn through the outside of that insulation and eventually cause a phase to phase pop. But the phase plot told us that there's a contact type problem, probably phase to phase, and then we look inside and we do have phase to phase contact problems. So that's a really good case study to start off with. Second case study here. So this is a TEV case study. So the test method used was one of the electromagnetic um, tests. This is an air insulated 11 kV chamber. Within the chamber is a CT, um, which is discharging. That CT has got very hard um, epoxy type insulation inside it. Now, when we look at this phase plot here, I can see that it's a single phase problem because I've got two clusters of activity 180 degrees apart. It's most likely that the PD is occurring within very hard insulation. And we can see that this leading wave on the first part of the, of, the, of the pattern that's being created. And that's the charge up and then discharge of the PD site, the initial, um, the initial pulse. And then we see a cloud that's just behind it, which I've circled here in red. That cloud will be caused by the space charges and the, the impurities left within the, within the defect where they would then be charged up and discharged again as your sine wave is rising and falling over your 50 hertz or 60 hertz sine wave. And this is the cause of the problem. These are, this is a common defect from manufacturer. These are called Ray Roll Allen PCT. They don't make them anymore. They made a lot of them back in the day. And the when we see that pattern, we suspect voids in hard insulation. Case study for number two. So here we, we can also see the void in the centre of the insulation. Now this is case study number three. So this one here again is one of our electromagnetic tests. It's the TEV test. This is taken from a pitch build 11 kV cable box. And when I look at that phase plot there, I can see five internal voids, and all of them are on the same phase. So this is a single phase problem, but there's five different voids. So up here on the right drawn five voids into the insulation. My phase plot shows me what looks like streaky patterns, but these would all be individual defects within the, within the, um, within the insulation. So the first defect gives me this phase plot, which I've highlighted in red down here. Then the second one I can see coming through there. The third one I can see coming through there. Fourth one coming through there, and then the fifth one is, is lower down, streaking through there. And then what I can also see is what I saw in the last um, case study where there's also a cloud, and that will be those space charges which are, which are discharging again. So you'd have an initial spark jumping a gap, and then there's enough time left in the sine wave and enough, 
enough charge left within that cavity and enough impurity in there where it would charge up and discharge again, just at a lower amplitude, which gives you that pattern there that we see with Brown pattern. That's case study number three. And this is where that, um, that test was taken from. So we did a TEV test at this cable box and inside that cable box is a pitch that moves around from time to time and opens up cavities, which all start to discharge. Okay, this is case study number four. So this one here is a contact type problem. This one here we were able to detect with four test methods. We combined it with the ultrasonic test method, the TEV test method, the HFCT test method, and the um, UHF test method. And I'll show you all four phase plots and they all look basically the same. So the one in the top left-hand corner here is the ultrasonic test method. We can see that long rectangular shape, which tells us that there's a contact type issue going on. Down here on the right, we have a TEV test. We can see long rectangular clouds as well. Up here in the top left, we have a UHF test method where we've stood there with a directional antenna. We've pointed it at the test object, um, or, or the defect, I should say, which is the test object, and we found the same pattern again. And then in the bottom right there, we've used a HFCT and we've captured the same pattern as well. So what the cause of this defect was, was here we have some 11 kV cables that had been made off in the past that were energised and they've been in service, but the earth screens that, that run from those terminations there were never actually earthed and bolted down to earth. They were just sitting and floating um, right near metalwork. So you can see there's one discharge source there where my mouse is on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side here, we can see that it's touching metal there and there. And so every time your sine wave is rising and falling, that part there is charging up and discharging and sparks will be jumping across that gap. Okay, this is case study number five, which actually has two sources within the same switchboard. So this switchboard is running at 22 kV, um, and we have found PD in here, and also in here with those two white arrows are. So this is the first source. When I look at that phase plot, well, first of all, I know it's surface PD because an ultrasonic um, sensor found the sound for me, and it looks like phase to phase PD because we've got to, because um, the, the phase plot is wider than normal. So we've got one there and one there. They would be the two phases getting involved. Third phase doesn't really look like it's getting involved because you've got lower amplitudes there. And the cause for that one was when we looked inside, we could see the two phases of the termination. There were two of the three phases. The sensor phase had a, an outdoor shed heat shrunk to it, and it was just charging phase to phase between this phase here and this phase here. So that was the cause of that one, and that was the phase plot that we found. Now in the next chamber, which is one chamber to the right, we found this phase plot. Now this looks like contact PD to me, and it looks like sharp points um, where discharge is occurring at set points on the sine wave. So you can see within this phase plot here, you can see you've got all clusters of activity that are very tight in, um, in their presentation. So if I go to here, I'll put a whole bunch of arrows where there would be sparks jumping across the gaps in at the defect. So the analysis of this is, first of all, surface PD because it's ultrasonic. Um, second of all, it's a contact type issue where you've got sparks jumping a gap. And also within that contact issue, there's probably something physically pointy and sparks are jumping out from the pointy thing to something else. And so they're the reason that we get PD jumping at those points, or the reason we get this pattern is because it will jump at set times on the sine wave. It'll charge up, discharge, charge up, discharge, charge up, discharge, over and over and over at set points. And that's why we get the tight clusters. And this was the defect for that one. We could physically see that there was some secondary wiring, probably from the CTs that are installed inside this chamber that was resting against the outside of the, the 22 kV cable, and there was sparking and arcing going on between that and that. So ultimately, it, was, um, it wasn't uh, terminated correctly, or maybe these wires had fallen down during service because they weren't secured correctly, and sparks were jumping across that gap. 
Okay, so this is case study number six. This again is an electromagnetic test. This is one of the TEV tests. This is a pitch insulated 11 kV chamber. And what we have, when I look at that phase plot, I can see four sources of internal void type PD on three separate phases. So up the top here, I've drawn the three phases separated out. Um, and what I've also done is I've highlighted where the four sources are. So when we look at this phase plot, the first source I can see is the most obvious one. It's the one at the top. So circled in red here, we have a high level or higher relative to the rest of them, a high level single phase surface PD. And then if I look up the top here, I've circled this in red. This would be a, a pretty big defect relative to the others in the middle of the insulation because it's discharging on both halves of the sine wave. So we know it's somewhere in the middle of the insulation as opposed to right on the edges. The next source of PD that we can see is the circle down here in green. So this phase here is 120 degrees onward from the first phase. So it's really 60 degrees onward because the two peaks in a three phase system will be 60 degrees away from each other. But what we can see is that's your first phase and that's your second phase. So this pattern here lines up with this pattern here, and that would be caused by a single phase defect on the second phase, whatever that may be. And then again, we move along to the third phase. So the third phase is the pattern here I've circled in blue. So we've got a cluster there, a cluster there, and then also this cluster at the start is really just the end of that other one at the right. Um, and we can see that that is just charging on the right hand side. All of those, because they've got clusters either side of the sine wave, will be in the middle of the insulation. Now the fourth source of PD, which is one of the harder ones to see here because it's so, um, so busy, but it's there, is the one that's just come up in purple. So this one here doesn't have a corresponding um, phase plot on the other side of the sine wave. So that one there would be a cavity that's very close to either the, the HV conductor or the earth conductor. Um, and it is in phase with the big one, with the big amplitude one. So that's why we're saying there's two defects on the, on the first phase, whatever that may be, one on the second, one on the third. And that's how we interpret that. Now where this was taken from was from a pitch field insulation cable box where there would be voids in that insulation. Okay, case study number seven. So this is earlier Neil mentioned um, oil, PD inside oil. So when we see PD inside oil, usually we see that by the TEV test and the best, what, we just had a question before, where's the best spot to run that TEV test? So technically the best spot to run a TEV test at a transformer is on the outside of the HV cables where they go into the transformer on the, on the earthed part of the, of the cables there. Um, now, when we see, when we do a test and we're, we're very close to something that's oil filled and we see this big round cloud type cluster with a fairly high pulse count, you can see the pulse count here is nearly 20 pulses per cycle. That's consistent with PD inside oil that's occurring inside oil. So we can see two big round clusters here, probably single phase PD occurring and the PD is occurring on both halves of the sine wave. Now the defect there, we found that one that there was a tap changer at a, this is a, an 11 kV to 415 transformer that was discharging at the tap changer. So if you do a TEV test and find that, you see that pattern, start to think about PD and oil and then you can move forward from there and do DGA tests and, and things like that, investigate the transformer or other tests on the transformer. Okay, now case study number eight. This one here is a noise source, but kind of kind of looks like PD, but it's not PD. So first of all, this is an ultrasonic test. Um, we can see a phase plot that follows the sine wave, but this here was taken from, I'll just show you the next photo. Not that one. This one here, <laughs> I'll just show you this photo. So it was taken from a noisy light bulb within a switch room. So we used an ultrasonic microphone, pointed it up to this light bulb, and we heard a 
certain sound. It doesn't sound like PV. It sounds more of a, a magnetic sort of sort of pump. That's the first part. But the fact, because we're talking about phase plots, this is the phase plot that it gave us. Now, where the um, the reason that we get this pattern is because electricity that's you know, an asset that's running at 50 hertz, which is the light bulb, has given us this pattern. So it's going to be in phase with with our um, with our phase plot and with our instrument. So therefore, we get phase plot. The tight clusters that you can see that I've highlighted here with the blue arrows, they would all be caused by something in the light bulb. Maybe it's the starter of the light bulb, or maybe it's the light bulb itself flickering. But it will be doing whatever it's doing at the exact same spot at the exact same time on the sine wave every time the sine wave goes through. So we get a build up of activity at those very tight clusters. Pretty similar to when you go to sparks, when sparks are jumping across a gap and they're all happening at the set times as well. Um, but this is how light bulbs behave. Okay. So that is the end of the case studies part. I think um, what I, what you really need to take into consideration is which sensor is seeing it, where you're seeing it, and what the phase plot looks like, and then think of think of um, where the PD site could be in a physical sense, and why it's giving you that phase plot. Um, so I'll hand over to Neil for okay. or, just uh, a couple more. They said lots of questions, lots, lots of questions, questions, which is which is good. Um, we should have answered most of them. <laughs> so, so really, that's the summary. The PRBD patterns. What if we go back in history and we look at uh, how we did non-intrusive um, PD testing? So, you know, EA Technology and, and uh, has been doing this now since the the 1980s, 1990s. When we first started, we were really only concentrating on what's the amplitude of the the TEV the TEV measurement. And then we move from what's the amplitude of the measurement to what's the amplitude and the, and the pulse rate, because the pulse rate will tell you stuff, as we were saying earlier, higher pulse rates on the surface discharge or on contact or in oil compared to inside the solid insulation. Uh, so we were always working on amplitude, working on pulses per site. Nowadays, whenever we do our analysis, we start with the PRPD. What is the pattern? If that PRPD pattern is showing noise, if we've got an absolute, we know that we've got a phase lock and it's just a straight line of noise, then we don't really need to go any further. We don't need to start saying it could be this or it may be that. We know from the PRPD pattern that it is discharge. We also know from the PRPD pattern, um, as Brad has been showing, the type of discharge it may be. So the, the more that we build these, um, these patterns and the databases up, uh, w the more that we'll be able to to really hone our diagnosis. So it's it's where we start. It's where we start in saying, have you got PD or not? So it's no longer are we going, um, this, these readings are consistent with PD. We're saying that is PD or that isn't PD. Now, in order to get the absolute thing we've shown before, if you can make sure you get that phase lock, the Ultratech Plus has got the inbuilt um, photoelectric sensor and it's got EE field and there's a manual, uh, manual sensor that you can use there. It is good to be reliable on that. We've got a new piece of kit I'll show you in a moment which, which will help that if, if you um, are struggling, particularly in switch yards and places where you've got LED lights, which are a pain. Think of the cause, as Brad was saying, of the pattern in that physical sense. You know, is it a, is it a gap? Is it uh, what type of void it will be? That, the higher the amplitude, generally the higher the cavity, but the, you, you, because of the, the cavities building up, you will also see, you know, you, you, you're not getting 100% consistency on every single time that it flashes across, unlike on a contact site. Knowing those, those common PD patterns is fundamental. So knowing what a gap discharge looks like, the two waves, the um, multi-phase discharge, the difference between single phase multiple phase ultrasonic will help you in your diagnosis and help you uh, answer the questions of what what is the problem, when do I need to address it. Just a, a, a quick advert on this, it's just absolutely um, launched, but we do have now an Ultratev 
um, a wireless phase reference, which can be used with that Ultratech Plus, which well, you can see in the picture here is we located on the switch yard. It will use the photoelectric or power supply or a gas coil or e-field itself in order to um, grab a phase reference and just wirelessly transmit that to the Ultratech Plus. So you do get those very, very consistent uh, readings. In switch yards, just use it for the last, the last week or so. Um, a bit of a godsend with that to make sure that you've got the highest quality data. So those are available. Um, some more information will uh, will will come along with the, the um, with an email giving you the links to the recording of the website of the webinar. Sorry. Um, and coming to the end of that, what we what we are offering. I mean, we'd like to share our knowledge. Um, we've got a lot of knowledge being shared by Brad furiously typing once <laughs> again. Um, and, and, and things aren't easy. If you've been, we've been in this a long time, other people um, not so long, but there's always questions that arise. We don't know all the answers, but we're getting better all the time. If you do have any challenges and you want to um, book in a session with us, we, uh, we do offer these, these short sessions. If you wanted to take advantage of that and you emailed um, Callista, um, then Callista will be able to book in that session. Currently, we've got um, three sets of sessions between one and three um, in our time, Australia time, or Brisbane time, East Coast, um, on next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And we could also do some sessions, not the following week, but the week after that. So if you are interested in, in having us discuss anything specific that you may have any challenge on that, please get in touch with us and we're quite happy to set up a, a team sharing session with you. All our contact details are here as well. Um, follow us on LinkedIn or whatever you do. Um, contact us on, on email and the website is always a good resource as well.